Positive images planted in a child's mind, then abruptly torn apart and reconfigured without reason or explanation. Rejection, separation, divorce, neglect, abuse. Lack of attention slowly settles in. A void is formed, a sense of security lost. Fear sets in and the struggle within begins. The heart of that child is left to seek and find a solution to fill that void. False solutions chosen often seen as answers, but they create illusions in the heart and mine. Illusions cause false identities. That child now lost in a world of confusion. Pray for those who will be looking at this uh, presentation. And Father, we just pray that they, their hearts will be touched by what they see and hear, that you will answer the questions and they will uh, have their questions answered by some of the things that we say. But we ask that the Holy Spirit would just touch them and, and, and bring enlightenment to them uh, about the things that they're seeking. We thank you that you have a good plan for everyone's life. You're saying good things about them. And Father, use this platform just to reveal yourself to them in a greater way. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. As a follow-up to our first taping, I uh, had some questions to come to mind as I watched it and reviewed it and felt that it would be good if we had some additional information for the viewers of our tapings. One of the first questions that came to mind when I was just listening to what we had recorded was, what are some of the things about myself that I stored away or even denounced or rejected because of the environment uh, that I was raised in, or even some of the situations that I experienced throughout my life growing up. And one of the first things that I could remember was at the age of four or five years old, we had gotten in trouble, the family, how many of us was it? Was it 15, I'm not sure, five, it was five of us. And we were all lined up in front of uh, our father. And Whatever the situation that happened, it was blamed on me. And my oldest brother got everybody to say that it was me. And I was trying to convince my father that it was not me and it was Ernie that had actually done whatever had happened. And he did not believe me. It was that situation at that young age that I decided or was convinced that my voice had no power because I was the only one telling the truth, but I was not believed. And it took ooh, almost my entire life to finally realize that that was the moment that I decided, me personally decided that I didn't have a voice and proceeded to live my life without one because I was convinced that if my father didn't hear me, Nobody else would. So that was one of the major things that I discovered about myself looking back on my life that has hindered me 
in relationships, in doing what I could be doing with my life, in living a fuller and better life for myself because I just didn't see myself as someone that people would actually listen to. And look what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sitting here talking on this camera, talking in this group, and it's almost like I'm saying, who is this girl? Well, this is the girl that was there, that shut herself down. All those many, wow. Mm -hmm. All those many years ago. Years ago. Are you still there? Or you have released her hand? I'm not still there, but I think this emotion is coming from the sadness for her. Yes. That's uh, <laughs> deep because coming from the same family and having almost the same incident where that same brother <laughs> didn't tell everybody to say it was me. He told me to say it was me because I wouldn't get in trouble because I was the youngest. And so what that did to me was I got in trouble for something that I didn't do and I live my life thinking that I'm always doing something wrong. If somebody doesn't call me back after I call them, I ooh wee. <laughs> I secretly, I'm telling you all my stuff, but I don't, <laughs> no more. I secretly feel like I did something wrong to you. And I, for the life of me, it's like, what is that? I mean, if you didn't call me back, I'm thinking, really thinking, did I say something wrong in my, long con my last conversation? Did I, did I, they don't like me? I mean, it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. And when you don't know where that's coming from, mm -hmm. and you're grown, you certainly can't say to the person, did I do something wrong to you? They're going <laughs> to think, think something's wrong with you. But just like her, I found out that that's, by me going to the psychologist, mm -hmm. I found out that that, was an incident that happened that happened to scar me um, back then. I mean, and if she was, you said four. Yeah, I'm a year behind her. So mine probably, I might have been four or five because, you know, we didn't leave there till we were six. I was six years old. So um, it just back again, we talk about the first five years, first seven years, how something takes a hold of you and mold you and then when you get grown you don't know what to do with it and you don't remember where it comes from until you start analyzing yourself mm -hmm. and so my question my my thing for me my process of moving away from that mm -hmm. i can't say that that's all all the way gone but it doesn't bother me like it did before. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I tell myself when something like that comes up, that was the child me. This did not happen to the adult me. And I have to give the adult me permission mm -hmm. to live mm -hmm. her life mm -hmm. without holding her hand. Mm -hmm. I have to recognize her and me. I have to give myself permission to be an adult because for a long time I am the adult but it's the child's hurt that's guiding me through life and it's, it's like I said in some of my talks when we did Community of Love, I raised my children, my, that little girl raised my children, she did a good job but then there's some areas that she smothered them. Because of her hurts, well, I don't want you to hurt. So she overcompensated. You know what I'm saying? She, 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 don't go nowhere. She almost went berserk when they left 
Like your situation is like now I'm being abandoned by my kids. I'm not thinking that my kids get grown like I got to be grown and get to go. I'm thinking you're supposed to, because it's like you're playing with dolls and you don't know it. Your dolls don't ever go in and you can always go get them out the case. But here these are living dolls and they're boys and they get to an age and they want to go. And I, my daughter got to stay here. I got to keep on playing with my doll. I got to keep protecting my doll. And I can't tell them that because I'm confused now because I know that I'm doing this. And I, I'm trying to say that to them without them knowing or even understanding. You know, this is really not me and I know what I'm doing and I hope this is not bad for you all. When they were in Atlanta, I talked to them practically every day. And I knew and it was a little girl just trying to hold on from feeling abandoned here. These are boy children. There was my father that left. You know, you feel like your husband is the only, it's like, okay, God, enough is enough. And it wasn't enough, or was I living through her? And I have to tell you all, the forever change, the, the, part that I'm saying, I'm crying. I was literally crying on the floor in my bedroom because I was tired. I said, I have to know what this is. It's driving me crazy. I'm doing things that are not, you know, it's like the adult wants to live and the child says no. And so God gave me a dream which was really crazy. It wasn't, I can't say it was a for real dream like that or a vision. Because I was in the bathroom, for real, combing my hair, getting ready for bed. Michael's downstairs doing something. And I literally walked into the bedroom to lay down. But all of a sudden, I'm being tossed across the bed. Now that part, I cannot tell you that that happened. I know I was not asleep. But I'm being boom, boom. I'm like, okay, now I'm scared because all the stuff you heard about back in the day, demons, I'm like, something that got up in here and it got me. And I'm sitting here trying to get to the phone and I can't reach it. And I'm trying to call him and say, come upstairs. And I can't get to the phone. Then all of a sudden, I bust loose and then I'm sitting up on the bed and I know that I'm sitting on the bed. And then there is a baby laying on the floor and it's brown. And it's crying. And I'm reaching down to find that, grab that baby, and I hear, don't. And I'm like, but, but why? He said, that's everything that you're asking me to deliver you from. Mm -hmm. So I sit back on the bed, and then there's a child in my arms that has on blue. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't remember the significance of the colors, but there's significance of those colors. And I got her, and I'm caressing her. And he says, this is the child. This is the hurt little girl. And you get to console her. And you get to grow her up. And he just had me talking and holding her and caressing her. And I'm like, okay, God, who am I going to tell this to that's going to believe me? Mm -hmm. I had a hard time even telling the psychologist because I'm like, you know, how do you, how do you tell me this? this? <laughs> but you knew something happened because you weren't asleep. Because when I got him, he came upstairs and he said, I look like I was spooked in my face. He said he knew something was happening, but he couldn't figure out what it was. And then right there at that point, it was like God is saying, she's at her wit's end. I'm going to show her she can see. And I saw, this is the nurturing little girl. It was like I went back to the little bitty baby girl. And God's going to take me to the point of walking her to the adult me. It didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen a minute. But when I shared it with the psychologist, he told me it made perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Perfect sense. And it was from that point, I wish I had written down, I wrote it, that the dream down, but I probably have to see if I wrote the date down because the timing of transition and process, people have to know you hurt bad, but it doesn't happen overnight. So what you have to do you believe in getting there and you want that, but you have to believe in the process that gets you there. Mm -hmm. If you can believe in the process, mm -hmm. then 
<clears throat> you can always, when you get thrown off course, you can always get back on and say, this is a process, this is a process. It's like when you are being born, like I said, and the other one, your environment that's making you, so God's saying, okay, now the born again spirit can happen and I'm getting ready to recreate you and I'm going to put things on your path and they get to wrap themselves around you and here you are at that point and you get these little things and you get you get to see the little girl the whole time or you get to see the whatever you had it keeps popping up in your head and that doesn't it so it's like you have to be aware that when it comes it's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's still reminding you that you're there on that point. Mm -hmm. And it's taking you to that other place that you're trying to get. Mm -hmm. But the process sometimes is, look, what am I? How old am I now? <laughs> my, well, I'm, I'm 10 years older than my 50th birthday, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm 12 years older <laughs> than my 50th birthday. So that, when I did my 50th birthday, that was me saying, this is it. I'm coming out. Mm -hmm. So that's 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we're at this point, and, and I guess I can see my tear, my tears are, are like tears of joy because it, it wasn't easy. I'm not going to tell anybody it was easy because unless you stay on and keep on seeking, and I don't mean seeking the way that they say, stay before the faith. I'm saying, God, who are you? Who are you for me? Who are you in this situation? What do I learn in this situation? What we're, and, and listening, have an ear because people, I'm telling you like when I talked about the squirrel and the dove. People even say things to you. And it's those things that you like, wait, wait, wait. And it touches somewhere in you. Mm -hmm. It's like, be aware of those things because he is constantly talking and revealing. And it's just like, he's, it's not that he's not there. The manifestation of him, it's like your desire is coming close to the manifestation. The manifestation is all around us right now for anything we want. Mm -hmm. It's right there. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the questions that I wrote down to just listening to our last conversation. I had written down, looking back, do you see where God showed up for you when you felt you were the most lost or alone? Mm -hmm. And part of the, the, when you're trying to evaluate your life, you have to be able to go through situations that you have experienced and recognize where you didn't at the time, where God was actually right there in it mm -hmm. and supported you through it. Mm -hmm. And how he even maybe have caused people to come in and out of your life yes. that took you from step one to step two to yes. step three, just to support you when you weren't able to, to do some of the things that you say where you're actually speaking directly to God, but you're, the, the desire of your heart is to be free. Yes. And you know there is a God, but you haven't gotten to the point where you, you know how to go directly to him and get, get it for yourself. He will, like you said, hold your hand and walk you to the next destination through people, through situations, through whatever he desires to use that will get your attention. Mm -hmm. And looking back over my life, I know so many people after the fact, hindsight, mm -hmm. that I know were put there on purpose because... My state of mind during some of those years was like, if they weren't there, where would I be? Yeah. But they were there walking me through, and I didn't recognize it at the time. So we have, as individuals who are really seeking to know God for ourselves have to be able to analyze and really pick up where God actually was there when you felt like he wasn't. Mm -hmm. There's some things, uh, that's why it's so powerful uh, the things that we experienced in our childhood, as you all were telling your story, I, I just began to think about some things that happened to me when I was a child. Um, you know, we were raised in a very authoritarian home, and when something happened in the home, my dad used to say, well, everybody's going to get a whooping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now that I think about that, I'm thinking, is that fair for everybody, for everybody to get a whooping if something happens? But... He would, he would line up and everybody would get a whooping. Mm -hmm. And I think that affected me to a degree. We couldn't really defend ourselves or say why we felt it was unfair. Or, and so I developed sort of uh, an inward to speak to myself inwardly and my skills to speaking to other people 
really subsided. Mm -hmm. And it took me a really long time, even after I was called into ministry. It, I, I was very, I, I tell people all the time now, I would have been an ex, uh, a, a good only child because mm -hmm. of speaking to myself, being by myself, into my internal conversation was always there. And I think that's directly related to living in an environment uh, where, you know, if you said the wrong things, you could get into trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, so you, I, I learned how to meter how I said things, the <laughs> yes, words that I use, yes, the, you do. The, words that, <laughs> the words that I use, um, and, and then now that I think about it, that has a lot to do with the environment that we were raised in. And I, I think that's why the Bible says to guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of light. And that word issue talks about the boundaries and the borders. Mm -hmm. So if you live your life uh, inwardly and you never uh, share what you have, you never uh, feel free to express yourself to other people, you'll deal with that. And, and again, even after I was uh, called into ministry, it took me a long time. I, when I, before I would get up to pray to speak, I would literally go through this thing in my mind. Maybe I can call the person and cancel and tell them I can tell them I'll let's do this another time. I mean, I would be going through this internal thing in my mind. Let me cancel and and maybe I'll have another time where I'll be more equipped to speak. I mean, I doubt it. Even though I was raised uh, where education was really important to me all through school, uh, I got two double promotions in grammar school in grammar school and uh, you know, so People were always saying that you're smart, you're smart, you this, that. People would call my parents to the school, you know, Michael is this and that. You know, so, but because of the fear that I had, that my voice, as Julie was saying, really had no value, even though I, I have a broad base of information and knowledge, I was afraid that what I was saying didn't really make sense. It had no value to it, even today. Sometimes I have to, in my mind, in my heart, I have to go over my message. I have to write it. I have to show Cheryl with them. I have to write, have all these notes. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time to get away from my notes. I had 12, 15 pages of notes because I, that was the way I, I compensated to say that what I have to say, I've got it here on paper. It's valuable. People need to hear this. The Lord's going to help me. But it was, there was always a struggle to really uh, authenticate or verify that what I had to say, somebody wanted to hear and that it was important. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the enemy uses that a lot against us throughout our life. When people, we had, even when the Lord gives us something to say to someone, mm -hmm. you know, we'll second guess it and uh, should I really say this or how should I say it? And it's good to say, to, to look at how you say things mm -hmm. to people. So that's a good thing. But to be afraid to really speak, that, that's, that's not a good thing. And, and that childhood wound that I received, uh, sometimes it takes a lifetime to really get past that. And I'm, God has helped me. I'm doing a lot better now when I speak. I'm not afraid. I mean, I still get a little, a little tingly. <laughs> a little tingly before. Can I ask a question? Yes. I'm, I'm hearing It's personal. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing you what you're saying, and I'm hearing you say it about speaking. Do you have that same fear within your marriage and with your children? Because you were very quiet. Their issue would be dad didn't say anything to us. So are you saying that came from your childhood of the inward? So you spoke to yourself and you just let everything go. And, you know, like when I share things about you with them, they're like, well, I didn't know dad was... You know, because you, you don't share, you, you can share the work. It's like you share the knowledge that you have, mm -hmm. but yet do you believe that you're at that place where the emotional part that is due me and them, you still hold back and don't share it? Yeah, to, to, to a degree, yeah. I mean, I still have an issue with... Uh, sharing a lot of the emotional things, a lot of, uh, I guess, things that are uh, 
past past knowledge, just personal feelings that I have. I mean, I have, I have a very, I still have a very vibrant inner life, and that's probably not good. No, it's not. I should, <laughs> let me be the first one to tell you. I should probably Boy, speak, two years speak a lot, <laughs> speak a lot more about what I'm feeling at a specific moment mm -hmm. or feeling about a specific situation or circumstance. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm saying the Lord is helping me. I, I had a, um, I need to speak, you know, more into the lives of, of our sons. I mean, I, I. I Try to do that on certain things, but I mean, I need to. I need to go deeper. I need to go well, deeper. And you know, when you say speaking to the lives of your sons, so, and yeah. letting them see your struggle, mm -hmm. but letting them know, just like what you're saying now, having that conversation where they would understand why you are like that, but then pressing past that to, you know, be show them, show yeah. them that daddy you. Yeah, that that that's that's something I need to do more. I mean, it's a process, and it's my desire to get past some of the things that I feel when there's a impulse to keep things in. You might have an impulse to keep things in, but I'm I'm trying to get to the point where no, I need to go ahead and say this so that they'll be able to take their own experiences, look at what I'm sharing, and have some, uh, be able to weigh those things out and be governed by whatever they come up with. Mm -hmm. Because you know, without without even being like your father, mm -hmm. a lot of your introvert, mm -hmm. I see it. I, I see it with, with Mike Laren. Mm -hmm. John is more outspoken, but I can see that. And you just, if we get to the generation to generation, you don't want to pass it on. And it's almost like it's a secret passing it on. If that was something to hinder you, okay, you're not going to do your father, but because you did you, you're passing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. All the things that you have said has brought up so much in me right now. <laughs> things that I even buried, they just came back mm -hmm. to my remembrance. Mm -hmm. but, and as I shared before, <clears throat> as a very young girl, <clears throat> really had an effect on me was the difference <clears throat> that my father made between me and my, my brother, mm -hmm. I mean, between my brother and myself. <clears throat> that when I was very young, and I just buried this, it just came back that I lived in a fantasy world. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. My imagination, I lived in a family that was different than my family. And my life was different because it was all of these wonderful things that I wanted my life to be. And because I stayed there for so long, that when I became older and had so much difficulty in trying to relate to people and men outside of the, of the family, mm -hmm. that I did not have a sense of who I was. Mm -hmm. Even into adulthood, I thought I wasn't grown. Okay. <laughs> and when I started going to work and uh, associating with the ladies at work, and even when they befriended me and I would be with them, I was modeling who they were, trying to put together a person right. to know who I was to find my own yeah, identity. I understand exactly what you're saying. <laughs> And then when people started, as I told you, leaving mm -hmm. and my husband dying, I thought that I was this awful person. No one wanted to be around something was really wrong with me because people kept leaving me. Mm -hmm. And instead of running to God, to the Father, I'm still trying to do things on my own, even to the point that I ostracized everybody else. I moved. I was living on the north side. I said, I don't need anybody. You know, I can just be by myself. And that didn't work out at all. It just made me more think that something was wrong with me, even to the point where I told you I saw monsters in the mirror. It became very agoraphobic for most of my adult life. And so this is just wonderful because I'm glad that, that, that it brought back that memory, you know. That I really had, had, had buried. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, there's 
a lot of things that have happened in, in my life that has, you know, brought me closer to God and changed, changed in my, my life. Certainly one letting go um, of me trying to run my own life mm -hmm. and going back to, to the Lord. You know, early at that time, especially when my husband died and I left, I was in, 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 in the world. And I wasn't relying on uh, scriptures. I wasn't in church. And as, as you mentioned earlier, I happened to run into a high school friend who graduated from school. And I wasn't in church. And I was in this relationship with this man. And when I saw her, she invited me to her church. And for, I think it was for uh, family week. And <clears throat> when I was in church, I felt this longing. The Lord was this, this longing in me as if he was calling me. You know, like saying, you left me, but I haven't left you. Yeah. And that was the beginning of me getting back into church. And then, as I mentioned, when I met you, it became a part of community of love. I was able to serve, mm -hmm. and which was something, was a motivational gift that I didn't realize I had it at, at the time. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, other things as well, when I took control of my thought life, mm -hmm. and would keep repeating who I was in Christ, Mm -hmm. And saying what he, what I mean to him, mm -hmm. that all the past was forgiven, mm -hmm. that I was valued, that I was loved, mm -hmm. that I was his daughter, that he loved me. Mm -hmm. And so those are some of the things that helped me to get to this ch change, to realize who, who I am. Mm -hmm. And to ask God to help me be a better steward of the things that he has given me. Yeah. Especially my, my time. Mm -hmm. So much time that I was in the world or watching television or doing other things other than really being in my word and studying my, my word and, and doing the things that I really wanted, had a desire to do. And one was to um, know more about the word, study the word. I wanted to go to um, a Bible school, mm -hmm. you know, and I put it off for years until. The, it was like the Lord said, okay, I know that's the desire of your heart. We opened the school on the south side, and I was able to, able to, uh, to, to go back. Mm -hmm. But those are just some of the things that helped me get to where I am to make that, that, that change, mm -hmm. is to um, really get into my word, mm -hmm. study it, mm -hmm. take time purposely to spend with the Lord, mm -hmm. and to have a more intimate, personal relationship with him. Does, does that the, um, fantasy part, does that ever come in and try to taunt you now? It, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I had totally forgotten about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and it took me so many years, you know, even into my 40s, even into my 50s. Right, see, yeah. Even to get to the point that I realized, okay, I'm a grown woman, I make decisions, I did all these things, you know, <laughs> I raised my son, you know. I bought a building, I paid for it, I stayed on this job, you know, you know, you are an adult, but it took me so long to get there because of that early childhood mm -hmm. trauma of things that happened in my child. Sounds like you don't realize, you're going through the motions without thought. You know, I'm going yeah. to, how mm -hmm. they say do things, this is what it is, but inside your heart is pounding, it hurts, yeah. mm -hmm. it hurts, something's wrong, you're yeah. secretly crying, mm -hmm. you're secretly not wanting to tell anybody because I'm standing here grown, looking like you, but then I'm crying about this and I don't know where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it, it, it wasn't a place, a platform for you to go tell mm -hmm. any, anybody, right. it's right. like, but because if you had the foundation, if you had the foundation of God, it's like, when everything else has failed, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Okay, God, let's try this one more time. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I got to try this one more time. And the only reason you don't try with God when, you're, when you're, your father is not there, that's when you have those kind of issues. Like, why would you hear me? Mm -hmm. why, why would you hear me? I mean, you know, they don't hear me. And because I see them, I've made them more important. That's the switch. Mm -hmm. No, I'm more important. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm more important than anybody in here, and I'm the one that manufactured you. You know, so I know your ins and outs, and your making. I know all of that. <laughs> so it's and, and I like that when Julie said, "Remember you, you, the process of the people that are coming." Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Julia has been a big instrument in mine. Mm -hmm. The little things that she's saying, but <clears throat> I remember one day I think I don't know that she had. I, it might have been shortly after that big cry I had. 
she gave me a card and I don't know what reason she gave me the card. Mm -hmm. But what she didn't know was the card she gave me is when a man him had a we had a um, a big bad part of our marriage mm -hmm. and I was ready to leave and I said God now this thing Julie didn't do this at that time. Mm -hmm. This is when the scripture I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. I said, if you want me to stay here, I'm crying, sitting on my grandmother's piano thing. You're going to have to show me now. I heard heard that at church they said, you don't do that. I'm going to open my Bible. You're going to show me a scripture. I'm sitting here crying, saying this, right? But i thinking it's not going to happen because the church told you you don't do that. And I, I don't forgot what they call that. So I'm sitting here, okay, show me. And I'll be like, I opened the Jeremiah 29 11. Hmm. It said, I know the plan. 1994. I can tell you that because I wrote that down in my because I was like, what? <laughs> he said, I know the plans I have for you. Then I opened another one and it was about um, movies. Um, uh, it's Ezekiel. It's 36 or whatever. I can't even remember that particular one, but I wrote down. Now, I'm going to tell you the significance of those two scriptures. Mm -hmm. That was in 1994. She gave me this car way after. I never told her the story. Mm. And it was like God said, I remember, I told you in 1994, I know the plans. That card is on my wall. Because mm. it was a reminder. I'm like, oh my God, he's speaking. That was him, you know. And here's the other one. The other scripture that was given to me. I'm crying somewhere. And I go get my grandmother's Bible because I'm just like, oh, this is my grandmother's Bible. And I open it up. And all, now you all know my butterfly stories. Mm. Mm -hmm. There is a uh, bookmark in there with a butterfly on it. Turn it over. Ask me what scripture she wrote down. The same scripture he gave me in 1994. Now she's gone. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, I got you. What do I got to do to let you know I got you? <laughs> Girl, I got you. Will you please stop crying? Follow me. Come on. Get back on this course. <laughs> So part of it, it's it's fun when you can go back and talk about it. Yes. But when you're in it, Whoa. it's like, hey, 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 yeah, I hear you, brother. <laughs> right. yeah. But the thing about that is, we've already did that journey. Mm -hmm. So now somebody who's just beginning that, mm -hmm. they get the information up front. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Because we didn't get the information up yeah. front. We get to tell them. Yes. We get to tell them. <laughs> Be on the lookout. Uh, Be on the lookout, because yeah. he's there. <laughs> oh, you know, because I told that was the other one. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you all this happened for real. All I know is every time I was on there for real. Mm -hmm. All I can tell you is during this time, the, the typical time with he and I and, and something else was going on. Every mailbox that I passed said trust him. Mm -hmm. To the point of, I'm like, now I know this is government property. Somebody sneaking around, putting trust him on that. So my brain is like, after I go through all this and get to where I am, I'm thinking, was it on there or did he just allow me to see that? <laughs> because it was like every post. And I'm like, I wish at that time I was carrying a camera because I would have taken a picture of that because it's like, trust him. I'm like, Lord, somebody's going to get in trouble with writing on, <laughs> on these mailboxes. But now that I think about it, they did not. He did. And he was just saying, so it's like, that to me is what I love the songs. I, I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Oh, my God. That's how I feel. I keep falling in love with him because he keeps saying, I love you. I love you. Let me show you I love you. I mean, you can't see me, but you can see things that I'm putting before you. I'm showing you that I'm here. I'm present. You just got to stop. Get your mind off of that. Mm -hmm. I know you were hurt. Guess what? Mm -hmm. I can use that. Mm -hmm. I didn't plan it for you. Mm -hmm. It happened, mm -hmm. but I can use it. Mm -hmm. Say, yea, though you walk through the valley. Mm -hmm. Guess what? I'm right there. Mm -hmm. He said, you, I'm the shepherd. Not one. When I found out that the Lord is my shepherd, because that's another theme scripture that he gave me, mm -hmm. I kept dreaming about that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that don't make sense. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. When I went to Bill Winston's church and he said, I shall not lose, I could have shouted all up and down the aisle when I found out that I shall not lose. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying, it meant so much to me because he kept having me dream about that. Mm -hmm. I wake up, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lose. You make me like I'm like, okay, you're giving me this. I will walk in the bookstore to go get somebody a Bible, and there's a book on the table. And I'm like, it said traveling light. 
And I don't know why I grabbed my attention at that point. I grabbed it. I'm like, oh, there's a nice picture on the front. It was a suitcase. And I'm like traveling like, and I'm trying to pull myself to go get the person's Bible. But then I go back and I look. And then I open it up. It says Psalms 23. Ask me, did that book come home with me? <laughs> because I knew God was saying, let me take you through traveling light. That's what I, people, I'm saying, if you hear me out there, <laughs> listen. Because he's talking. He hears you. He wants you. He loves you. He loves us so much. He's not trying to leave us. He's not thinking about what you did. Because he said, my son hung on the cross for all of that. He saw, I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at you through my son's eyes. Yes, yes, yes. And that's deliverance. Mm -hmm. That's freedom spiritually, physically, and emotionally. Yeah. Born again is rising up and turning mm -hmm. your life over like you're coming out. <laughs> you, if you got to do that, do that. Yes. Because guess what? That is where he's taking you back. Moving all of that off of you, coming out of your mother's womb, you're coming out of the spiritual womb, you're coming out of the spiritual womb of life. Yes. The womb, not the spiritual womb, the natural womb of life. Mm -hmm. And he says, I want you now to walk in the spiritual womb. Mm -hmm. I mean, come, come rest in the spiritual womb. Mm -hmm. And then when you come out, you get to start teaching. Mm -hmm. When you come out, you get to start doing whatever it is you want to do. You get to come out and you get to say, I can stand before these people and I don't feel anything. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, is gone. Mm -hmm. All things are passed away. And all, every last one of them, it's new. Mm -hmm. I'm walking in the newness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on, Kilo, with yours. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything to add. <laughs> yeah, the, the, uh, it, we were talking about, uh, who was that that said that your it, the events from your childhood is like playing a tape. A tape is playing behind in your life, mm -hmm. and as adults, we will be we would be amazed at how many decisions we make based on that tape, that background tape that's playing in our life, and and that most of the time it's it's about things that we traumas and troubles that we experience in our childhood. And I know a lot of decisions that I make. Uh, you know, it, you, you could directly relate to things that happened to you when you were a child. It was like to his first question. What did you take on mm -hmm. from your childhood? That yeah. you can say, did it make, what did, what part of your personality is that part of your childhood? That you took on. That you took on. You don't want to talk to people. Mm -hmm. I was scared to be in front of people and, and, and I feel like I'm not, I felt, I felt. Mm -hmm. Let's make that clear. Mm -hmm. That I wasn't smart. Mm -hmm. I felt that I could not do things, and I felt that I didn't feel fit in. Right. Julie felt that she couldn't. You, 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 who's going to hear me? But all those, all those are lies. That that wasn't fact. No, no, no. I'm saying I know that they're not facts. I'm saying this is the stuff that comes in your childhood that you're saying that the tape that keeps playing over. So as you're growing up, well, I can't do that because I'm smart. But he plans for you to teach. Mm -hmm. He from the. Mm -hmm. From in, in the, the beginning, mm -hmm. right? What you say? In her mother's womb. Yeah. yeah, that's right. In your mother's womb. He said, "I know the plans I have for you. Mm -hmm. I, I knew what they were when I sat here and said, you know what? Um, your mother and father's gonna get together, and they're gonna oh, they're gonna have this baby. They're gonna call her Gwen. So let me orchestrate her inner makings, her spirit, and I want her to do this and that and that. And he sets it, and he mm -hmm. there it is." Mm -hmm. But then when you come out in the natural, here comes all the other. And then all the things that you experience or that we all experience throughout our life, God doesn't, doesn't cause them, but he can use them. He can redeem them, the people that came into our lives, the situations that came into our lives, and whether or not they were positive or negative, God has the uncanny ability to take those things, even things that we would label as hurtful people who were in our lives and spoke negatively into our life. God can still take those things and, as it says, work them out for our good. So our journey, we don't have to despise, the Bible says, despise not the day of small things. Anything that happened in our life, we don't have to despise those things because God is working things out for our good. The good, the bad, and the ugly. He's taking those things and he's forming them so that they work out for our benefit. 
And mm -hmm. and the, the word also says that he's not gonna mm -hmm. you're not gonna experience thing, experience anything that's more than you can bear. Yeah. So right. if it's in your life, you have to be able to see that you're gonna get to the other side of it. Even though it's hard, even though it's difficult, even though you may feel like you're dying in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Nothing is going to come in your life that's more than you can bear. Amen. And see, that's even a tool. This is where the way that I like to look at the Bible, the way that I read it, I'm like, oh man, that's another tool in the drawer. He not going to let anything happen to me, so that means I must be able to get through this. Like you're saying, see the other side of it. What did he say as opposed to what did they say? Mm -hmm. I want to, I want, so I asked somebody, somebody told me, he said, they say such and such and such. They were talking about me being rebellious. I said, okay, mm -hmm. can you introduce me to they say? <laughs> <laughs> See, I know God, but you got to introduce me to they say. If you can't introduce me to they say, then I don't, I can't hear. <laughs> so the scriptures tell us that when we, when we walk through yes. the valley of the shadow of yes. death, yes. We, it's, it, that, that word is saying we're going to make it through. Mm -hmm. And it's not many of the things that we're afraid of. They're just shadows. They're not really real. We, they might make us feel a certain way, but uh, they're not death. They're not going to kill us. It's the valley of the shadow of death. It might feel like death. It might be situations that we don't know. But it, all we got to do is keep people, keep up yeah. as the young folks say, keep, keep it moving. Going. Keep <laughs> moving and walk fire? through. What, what about the fire? Yeah. He said it won't burn you. Mm -hmm. That's right. He said the fire won't even burn you. Mm -hmm. Then he turns around and tells you, guess what? You're in the battle, but it ain't yours. Mm -hmm. You get to stand there and watch. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even have to participate in it. Just follow me. <laughs> and if we're not obedient to his word, that's, good. That, that's one of the things that keeps us in that valley where we're not obedient. Right. But, but you have to separate, okay, when, when we hear the word obedient, mm -hmm. most people hear it, they take it back to the obedience of you and a child and your parents. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I can't, it's an obedience, mm -hmm. but it's not the obedience like that to me. It's like, I'm giving you my word. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm giving you my word. So it's like following. Mm -hmm. And I think people get scared of the word. I'm not saying don't be obedient. Mm -hmm. I think they get scared of the word obedient because it means if you weren't obedient, you're going to get a whooping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like when we, when we express obedience to God, it's like he just said, here, here's my word. Mm -hmm. You follow the words that I put in here, and that's being obedient to it, but it's not the consequences of lack of following it is you don't get the manifestation. Mm -hmm. That's good. Well, that's when I use the word obedience, one of the, one of the things that I've gained mm -hmm. from understanding how important it is to be obedient to his word is a closer relationship with him, being more intimate with him when I'm obedient to his word. When I was trying to, a um, couple of weeks ago now, I was to deliver our lesson for Bible study for okay. Wednesday night. And usually, I would just sit down and say, okay, Lord, it's my turn. What do you want me to say to your people? Mm -hmm. And whatever the subject matter or the thing was, I would be able to listen to him. He would give me scriptures, and I would come up with a lesson. Mm -hmm. This particular time, I had the hardest time trying to come up with a lesson. Mm -hmm. And I had thoughts, and I would write them down. I had almost 10 pages of, of thoughts, and I couldn't put anything together. And I said, Lord, what's going on here? And I had gotten a phone call from my um, deceased husband's sister, and she was telling me about the situation of um, a relative called, and you no, know, it was her own... Um, granddaughter who was homeless mm -hmm. and um, was with an abusive man mm -hmm. and she was trying to find some place and immediately I thought she was going to ask me to bring him into my home mm -hmm. and then she went on to tell me that wasn't the situation she wanted to know if I knew anyone who wanted to rent an apartment and I mm -hmm. you know told her I, I didn't mm -hmm. and then what came to mind that I was sitting with that same situation with my own great niece mm -hmm. that I had heard that her grandmother, my brother's first wife, had put, had put a rock, which I was 13, and um, I had been thinking about this child for years, that she was in a situation that wasn't healthy, and I thought I was yeah. being selfish, didn't want to bring her into my home, and then 
when I heard about her situation, because my sister and I had called and brought up the same situation, it was like I was, and I knew that I should have reached out to them, to my nephew and to her, just to offer what can I do, mm -hmm. and I didn't do it. And it was like, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I had even got to the point that I called Pastor Dean and told him that I couldn't do it, that I had all this stuff, but he would have to take Wednesday night because I, I just couldn't do it. And when I went to bed that night, I was still thinking that I was not going to be able to put it together. When I woke up the next morning and got out of bed, I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, sometimes your lesson is in your confession. Mm -hmm. And when, he, when I got that message, I knew instantly that I was going to be able to put this together. And when I put it together, and, and the message that I brought to them, I was led to know that sometimes we get stuck because we aren't obedient mm -hmm. when we hear God speaking to us and we know he's speaking to us mm -hmm. and we don't do what he tells us to do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we get beat up just because we're not obedient to God's mm -hmm. voice. Yeah, that's what, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't trying to bash mm -hmm. the word obedience. I was just saying some people, mm -hmm. I know I used to cringe when I heard it because it took me back to my childhood, mm -hmm. when you're not obedient, you're standing in line, everybody's going to get a whooping. Mm -hmm. And that's not what, it's, it, you can't compare a natural obedience to the spiritual, spiritual obedience, right. Right. because it is really listening it's to God's, God's word. word. It's like, he's not beating you down, he's just not getting to the point that you need to get, get to you. Right. At, at the time that you wanted to get there because of your lack of hearing right. or, or picking it up and say, I should, and no, mm -hmm. I won't do it today. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I, I really wasn't you know, but I know people have had that because I, I was one on like, don't say that word will be this. like we live in it, you know. <laughs> but I was just trying to clarify that for people that might say, well, here we are, we're in church and you got to be obedient and God's going to beat you down. If No, it's not like that. It's just that when you're seeking things out, he says, okay, you're seeking me out and I have a plan. And and, and if you don't follow his plan, just like if you don't, don't, if you get a bike and you, you get the instructions and you don't follow them, you, what's your bike going to look like after you put it together? The, 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 true, biblical, right. the true biblical term for obedience and commandment mm -hmm. are really not what we think they are. We, we think a commandment, if you don't do this, I'm going to get you. You know, No, the, the, if you look at the original language, commandment really means prescription. So God is telling us, do this. I'm, I'm telling you to do this. Not because I'm going to get you, but because this is going to work out for, for you, for your benefit, advantage. and for your advantage, for your good. Mm -hmm. So uh, everything that God does, uh, we're, we're living in a time of grace now. We're not living under judgment now. A lot of people will say, well, this is happening because it's God's judgment. Katrina, when the flood came, that was God's judgment. No, I don't think it was God's judgment because when the planes hit the towers in New York, that was God's judgment. I'm like, no, that's not God's judgment because a lot of Christians died in that too. Mm -hmm. God is not judging anybody now. All of his judgment was placed on Jesus. So we're living everything God is doing in our life now is from a basis of love. He's drawing us with his love. He's, he's love anybody, whosoever will, let them come. Everybody is living under God's love right now. And there's going to come a time of judgment, but it's not today. Uh, so when we see the word obedient or commandment in the Bible, we should always think God is prescribing that I do this because he's trying to get something good into my life. You he's trying say, to get... say that again because, see, a lot of people take, go to the doctor and get a prescription mm -hmm. and willing to follow the <coughs> to get better. Simple as that. <laughs> so if a commandment, just say, he's commanding me, he's prescribing to you. Pick it up. See the RX on there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> do, do this because it's going to work out for your good. It's for your good. If you do it this other way, it's, gonna, it's a curse attached to that. But yeah. I'm prescribing that you do this. Yeah. It's like in, in high school and in school when the teacher gave us an open book test. Mm -hmm. The Bible is full of things where God will say, I put before you life or death. Now, this is the open book part. I tell you to choose life. He's telling us, do this because this is going to work out for you for your good. But we take a lot of things that God says because of teaching, traditional teaching, that if you don't do this, God's going to get you. This, this is going to happen to you. No, God is, he, he wants us to have a good, he said, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and life more abundantly. So everything that he's telling us to do 
is out of love. And that's how you get stuck into your childhood, mm -hmm. because you hear mm -hmm. exactly what you're saying, that the traditional way they taught it, so mm -hmm. you're going into a traditional church, but mm -hmm. you can't let go of, um, how, what am I trying to say? You're, you're prescribing the, the commandment. It's the loving part of it. Mm -hmm. You're not hearing mm -hmm. the loving part of God. You're being told as a, like I said, stand in line, bend over, get the belt, let's whoop you. Mm. you, you it's a beat down. And so a lot of people will turn away because they don't want it. And, and like I said, a lot of times you go and you're still not healed. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. So, but, but to break it down like that, mm -hmm. that that's a... That's good. That's just like the massage and heart thing you yes. did last time. Yes. <laughs> that's that's good. The prescribe and the the, the um, oh, yeah. obedience. Is that, I had, it's funny when you said that because I had written something long about the obedience because I was feeling that. I'm like, this obedience can't mean this. Mm -hmm. It cannot mean this. <laughs> so, Kilo, you know, last time we were talking, you talked about your grandmother pouring into your life. Mm -hmm. What exactly does that look like? So last time I talked about uh, kind of the traumatic upbringing I had with my mother for a lot of years, probably until I was 14 or 15, just this mix, mix matching personality. I was an introvert. She's a strong extrovert. So like Mr. Gordon, my mother did a lot of talking to and talking at, and there was no, sh you know, sh no sharing. Like her and my sister, they had this shared communication to be like. She would ask my sister, why did you do that? Why didn't you come in at a certain time? Uh, why did you respond to me like that? We didn't have that shared language, love language at all. She was more like, you're the oldest. I didn't expect that from you. What were you thinking? It was almost like I couldn't do anything right. Everything was wrong. Uh, and it, I guess she didn't know how to reach me. And so at some point, I went inside. And... I guess through prayer, my grandmother figured it out because I didn't want to sing at church anymore. Um, I didn't have a lot of communication with my mother at family functions. And my grandmother, I guess, perceived it in her spirit, if you can say. She knew something that was a disconnect and she had to save me. And so what she did was just um, let me come over to her house on weekends. And um, if we were off from school, I would be over there with her. And at some point, I eventually moved with her. And so what the pouring looked like was that she would sit me down because my grandmother, excuse me, she's very open about having a, uh, being illiterate to a point. She could read the Bible like a scholar, but other things she struggled with. And so she would sit me at the table and literally read scriptures and upon scriptures and chapters upon chapters. And then she'd have me read and she'd be like, what well, Kilo, what you think? And those were some of the first times I remember anybody asking me, what did I think? Mm -hmm. And that opened me up where I began to trust my grandmother uh, but I didn't really trust other people because of my mother it's like if you come too strong at me I shut down mm -hmm. if you don't pull out of me I don't give it's like it, it, it's 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 like you know you all have talked about it's the rewriting of everything that had been uh, written upon your heart just erasing that trauma and my grandmother she slowly did it but she started with the bible she started with asking me what did I think she started with asking me, uh, it's three services Sunday. You know you got to go to one, but are there any others you want to go to? She just began to ask me about me, ask me about uh, my feelings. She began to let me really tell her about my, my, my baggage with my mother. She was a safe place where I was able to say, uh, Grandma, I don't understand. I think my mama hate me. And she would always say, she don't hate you. She don't understand you. Is that, is that your mother's mother? My mama? mother's mother. So that's what some of the pouring looked like. Yeah. She could do that because she knows her daughter. Right. right. That's why I did. Yes. That's right. <laughs> yes. And that's she why it was blank. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was so safe. And she gave you your voice back. She did. She did. She did. That, that's absolutely <laughs> positively one of those things like Julie was talking about that's on your path that you can't see in the beginning. Right. But it's placed there, and you responded in the in the right way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your heart was open. Yeah. Hey, the secret <laughs> is 
Is that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People driving around.